Um, for those of you joining us, my name is Jeremiah Fioravanti. I'm the president of the Delaware County Institute of Science. Um, this is our, our second year of a digital Zoom webinar lecture series. Um, and it's no small feat considering uh, we've been around in person for quite some, some time. Our, our organization was founded in 1833. The building we currently reside in, in front of the courthouse in Media, Pennsylvania, was built in 1867. I encourage you on some of these nice November days to come by and take a look. We've just had a new roof put on. We're starting to get some paint applied to the windows and the outside. So things are moving along slowly but surely with hope that we will be open to the public and we're returning to normal in this upcoming year. Um, so I just want to thank Dr. Laura Gurdon from Penn State and Dr. Dan King from Drexel for digitally managing this series and helping arrange it. Um, our next speaker will be December 6th, same time on the internet. 2021 North Atlantic Hurricane Season by Dr. Kimberly Woods. So you can learn more about our these weather phenomena that we encounter in the fall. And without further ado, uh, Dr. G, will you please introduce our speaker? Absolutely, thank you, Jeremiah. And so, uh, so everyone knows that the chat you will find out is closed, but we encourage all of you during this evening's presentation, please get all your questions into the Q&A. You can put them into that Q&A at any time and Dr. Lawler will uh, respond to them when he is finished speaking about this amazing topic that I know he is so excited about. So let me just quickly introduce you to Dr. Timothy Lawler, who is an associate professor who teaches physics and astronomy at Penn State Brandywine and Media. Uh, he has a bachelor's, master's, and PhD all in physics, and he has uh, done an amazing amount of research and published in some pretty prestigious uh, publications such as the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and the Astrophysical Journal, but I think he is best positioned to explain his research and uh, the, the main focus of tonight's topic, uh, the James Webb Telescope. So Dr. Lawler, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you for that. That was very nice. <laughs> Let me uh, share my screen and we'll get started. So, well, thanks. Thanks all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come in and listen to this talk. Um, this, as, as Dr. Gurton just said, um, this is, this is going to be all about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it won't be everything about the James Webb Space Telescope because it's, uh, there's just so much that it's going to do. Um, you know, they say it's going to impact virtually every, every branch of astrophysics. Um, and so we can't talk about everything, but I picked out a few that I thought were particularly interesting. Uh, and that's what I'm going to uh, share with you here. Um, so the um, the uh, so so right here on this slide, you can see how big this telescope actually is. This is a, a scale version that they built out in front of the uh, the building where they'll run it. And and down on the bottom left, you can see there's a uh, there's a, that's the real telescope being built. So let, let's just jump right in. Oh, there we are. So this is who I am. Um, I'm, I'm Tim Lawler. I, I teach at Penn State Brandywine. Uh, the, um, I've been there for 15 years. I've been at Penn State for longer than that. Uh, and I noticed that we have 15 four-year degrees there. I'm not sure if people realize that. I'm not sure anybody. No, no, nobody seems to know, know that we've now become a, a nearly a four-year college. We have some four-year degrees you can finish there. Um, I teach physics and, uh, for engineers and scientists. And my research is in computational stellar evolution. Uh, which is, as you can tell from this picture, uh, the, cha the changing from protostar to sun-like star, and then eventually they, they die in one way or another. Either they explode or they uh, collapse. Uh, I, I've studied all of these computationally. And so, um, of course, the James Webb Space Telescope is something that observers are going to use for their research. So, um, so this is just a little bit about what I do, and I'll say a little bit about, about why I'm interested in something observational astronomers do when I'm a computational astronomer. Uh, so, uh, so that's what I do. Uh, this is what people think I do when I tell them that I'm an astronomer. Uh, they, they think I walk around with a telescope on my shoulder uh, and take pictures like this on the bottom right. Um, I would love to be able to do that. I, I do, I do uh, play with telescopes. I teach a lab that has telescopes, but um, they're more modest, um, and and uh, and my research doesn't directly use telescopes. I use what other people do with telescopes. Uh, this is what my relatives and my friends think I do. <laughs> uh, 
pretty much for every Thanksgiving for maybe 10 years, um, somebody asks me uh, if I'm going to work at Matthew. <laughs> I don't, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> so the James Webb State, so this slide is a slide that I use as the last slide of my astronomy class every, every year. Um, and, and the reason I do is because I think it sort of puts everything that we talk about into perspective in astronomy. And so what is this slide? It's this, this uh, breakout on the bottom right is a picture of the earth taken on Valentine's Day, 1990. So if you remember that day, you were in that picture, it's a, a family picture. Uh, and uh, it was taken by Voyager as it left, as it left the solar system, or, or actually as it as it passed Pluto's orbit, and it turned around and took a picture of us. And I think that this sort of, uh, you know, really captures the excitement of astronomy and just how humongous the universe is. And I think Carl Sagan said it best. This is this is a completely a partial quote. I encourage you to look up the entire quote, but uh, what Carl Sagan said um, when when he saw this picture was, "Look at that! Look at that dot! That's home! That's us! On it, everywhere you love, everyone you know, everyone you'll you've ever heard of, and every human that ever was lived out their lives on that mote of dust suspended in the sunbeam." And and so, the, why am I talking about this picture from forty five years ago? Um, I think it's because that's that's the the same um, the same feeling that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to provide to us when it when it finally gets up and starts to to look at things. It's really going to be that big of a revolution. It's uh, the things that we're going to find are going to be things that we haven't even asked yet. So we have a lot of questions we know we're going to answer with the James Webb, but there there are certainly going to be questions that we haven't even asked yet and uh and so and so those uh those questions will will arise and and ho hopefully uh, we'll answer them as we go but i'm going to say more about the things that i think we can answer um i'll also say some things about um why i'm interested in it and uh some of the engineering feats that they had to overcome to get this thing to fruition so um, the reason I'm interested in it is that in the distant past, um, we know that stars were made of just hydrogen and helium um, in the early universe. And so I've studied early universe stars, I've modeled them. And so I'm interested to see, uh, to test my models, right? Because until now, we really don't have any direct, real good direct observations of the early light from the early universe. Um, you have to look really far away to see it. And I'll explain why that is later. But um, so this will be the first time that some of the models that I've, that I've uh, calculated that are related to the first stars that I can actually test them and it'll inform us, you know, maybe we need to make changes to our models. Um, by the way, this is, this is a, a picture of Cassiopeia A. It's a supernova remnant. Um, and recently, uh, observational astronomers discovered that it's full of calcium. Um, and so, and, and, and that, was a, that was a big breakthrough. And in fact, calcium in any element really heavier than, than iron is created in a star like this that blew up. Um, so with those words in the air, you can imagine everything in your room and in your body uh, is likely made of calcium and things like iron. Uh, and so all of those things then were created uh, in a star that exploded sometime before the sun existed and the earth existed. So that's one of my favorite um, sort of factoids about astronomy is that all of the atoms that were made of came from something like this uh, more, than, more than 5 billion years ago. Uh, this remnant, by the way, contains a million earth masses of oxygen and it contains all of the, um, it contains all of the um, molecules and atoms that you need to create DNA. So, so it's, it's sort of an exciting uh, truth. So, so Hubble, Hubble was uh, the predecessor to the James Webb Space Telescope. And it in itself was a, was a revolution. And, and so the James Webb is gonna be even more revolutionary than Hubble was. But Hubble uh, really brought to life new pictures that were that we couldn't have imagined before Hubble went up. 
Um, this is a, a star called BA38 uh, 38 Montosaurus, which is a star that I studied uh, for a while in the early 2000s. Uh, the Hubble Deep Field, uh, probably one of the most uh, jaw-dropping discoveries of Hubble. Uh, somebody decided that they were going to point the Hubble Space Telescope at a point just above the Big Dipper that where there wasn't anything special. It was just sort of dark night sky. And they opened it and let it run for uh, uh, numerous days. Uh, and the picture they got was this. Um, wh what you're looking at here is uh, a postage stamp sized piece of the sky full of galaxies. These are all, these are, some of these are stars, but most of them are galaxies, other galaxies like our own Milky Way. Uh, and so each of these contain somewhere upward of 100 billion stars each. And this is just a postage sized uh, area on the sky. Uh, and then of course, uh, one of the famous Hubble um, pictures was the, um, the, the Pillars of Creation, which they dubbed it so because they, they believe that inside these dusty clouds are new, new suns being born. And you can kind of see the light streaming out uh, from, the, from the dust. So this is what Hubble's legacy was. And the James Webb is gonna have something at least as uh, profound as what we found with Hubble, probably a lot more profound. Um, and we'll find out why that is. By the way, this is just a breakout. That's, that picture on the left is, is here in the circle, right? Just to give you an idea. It's about, let me back up. It's about five, um, it's about five light years across, right? You can easily fit the sun and our next nearest star, uh, Alpha Centauri, inside the width of this uh, cloud. Uh, so these are, you know, just humongous uh, structures. So another uh, another uh, really revolutionary discovery, not so much a discovery, but confirmation that that Hubble um, gave us was gravitational lensing. Uh, in 1995, as a young graduate student, I remember this sort of grainy black and white picture being uh, published, and uh, you can see that this, this is a big cluster of galaxies that are in, in the foreground. And all of these sort of wispy, ghost-like um, long structures are actually galaxies behind those galaxies further away. And what's happening is that the light from the distant galaxy is getting bent around the, the uh, gravitational uh, well of the foreground galaxies, right? This is something that Einstein predicted would be the case um, in, in the early 1900s. And they, they did use a solar eclipse to confirm it, but this is, this is an incredible uh, picture of gravitational lensing. So it helps us see things that are even further away. So Hubble was even more effective than we expected it to be. There's another really neat one. There happens to be a galaxy directly behind this foreground galaxy, and uh, it's lensed almost a, in a complete circle around the foreground galaxy. So how is Hubble and James Webb, uh, how, will, how does James, James Webb compare to Hubble? For one thing, it's quite a lot larger. Um, it's a six and a half meter mirror compared to Hubble, which is, uh, was, was about two and I guess three and a half. Um, and so the light gathering power, which grows as the square of the diameter of the telescope, uh, the light gathering power is gonna be significantly better. Um, so the James Webb will be able to detect things that are 10 billion times as faint as you can see with your eyes, uh, but 100, up to 100 times more faint than what Hubble has seen so far. And you can see it's just quite a lot bigger, um, even, you know, compared to the human on the far left here. It's, it's going to be a mammoth-sized mirror, and uh, that's part of the reason it's taken so long. Um, we have to be able to, to get this mirror folded up into a rocket and then launched, right? And so... Um, no small task um, for the engineers. So the James Webb Space Telescope was gonna launch, uh, uh, it, it may have even been before this, but as I recall, it was 2007, which I told my astronomy students for a number of years, until it wasn't, and then it was 2013. And this went on for years, uh, all the way up until 2019, when I was sure it was gonna take off uh, and it got pushed back to March of 2021. And it was briefly, November 2021, and now we feel really sure it's going to be next month. So this is a big deal. And uh, it sort of was mocked a little bit by XKCD Comics, um, <laughs> the, uh, the graph of 
uh, the plan date versus the current date. And um, hey, look, at least it's less than a slope of one. <laughs> so, so it really, so by the way, it has actually now been packed up, put on a ship, has uh, been shipped to, uh, to French Guyana in, in South America. And that's where it's gonna. That's where it's gonna um, launch um, off the coast uh, of South America. So, so why all the delays? Well, there's a lot of reason for the delays. Um, but one of the one of the things is that you really had to make sure that you've tested this, and that you have to get it right because there won't be any repairs possible like there were with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, right, the Hubble went up. Its mirror was shaved less than the width of a human hair off. And when they opened up for first light, everything was blurry, right? So they had, they had a, a space shuttle at the time that they can send up to it and they could put on a lens to correct for it. And it's been great ever since, but this telescope is not gonna be so close. Um, so in this slide on the, in this picture on the right, you can see where some uh, satellites are and things like that. And Hubble is orbiting sort of in this range of, um, you know, about, about three or 400, miles up from, from Earth. So we can get to it. So where's the James Webb going to be? Uh, is it going to be as far away as the moon? Uh, nope, that's not where it's going to be. Is it going to be twice as far as the moon? Three times? Nope, it's going to be four times further away than, than the moon is. So if we get it out there and there's, there's some kind of a, of a problem with the mirror, there's not going to be any, any good way to go out and just fix it. So this thing has been tested uh, for a long time under a lot of different conditions with clever engineers uh, at the helm. And so we believe we have it right. Uh, the, the place where it's going, it's not going there just because we want it to be far away. It's going there um, for a specific reason. It's known as something as a special point in space called the Lagrangian point. So there are these Lagrangian points, which you can see in this rotating wheel here. Um, these are sort of semi-stable uh, orbital places where if you put something there, it doesn't require much energy to stay there, right? And so, so uh, every two-body system has this. Um, if you look at uh, the Sun and Jupiter, Jupiter has a Lagrangian four and five point, and sort of in those areas, there's a bunch of asteroids all stacked up there, kind of just uh, clustered in in uh, the four and five. Uh, and so you can. Hopefully this is going to work. This is just a quick simulation of where, where it's going to be. So there's Earth, there's the Lagrangian too, and that's where the James Webb is going to be orbiting out. out it's going to be orbiting sort of around the L2 point, um, way out past Earth. Uh, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. You can see that the sun shield is blocking the sun. Um, it's actually a sun, Earth, and moon shield. Um, it has to actually block all of us, um, and we'll find out more about why that is as we go. So the James Webb is gonna use infrared light. You can see the Hubble was largely invisible. Um, James Webb will see a little bit in the red visible light. So there will be some uh, really pretty pictures to be had, um, but it's largely gonna be in the infrared. And um, you know, we, we can't see the infrared with our eyes, but there's good reason why, why we conducted it. Uh, well, we, why we built it to see infrared light. Uh, and, and I promise there's a reason why there's a motorcycle jumping uh, in this picture. A little bit about the engineering of, uh, of the, the telescope. Uh, 6.5 meter mirror, very large, has a very thin gold coating over it, which turns out uh, makes it especially sensitive and reflective to infrared light, which is what, what we want. Um, the seeing resolution is going to be remarkable just because it's so big and it's in space. Um, it, it, uh, you know, to to kind of bring it to something that we can understand, you'd be able to see the details of a U.S. penny that's 24 miles away. Or you could see the details on a regulation soccer ball uh, if you put it out in Pittsburgh, right? Well, of course, you'd have to hold the ball up and, and raise up your camera because the, the curvature of Earth, of course, would... would, would for, for, you know, forbid you from seeing it in Pittsburgh, but you get the idea. Uh, it has this tennis court size sun shield, five layers. It's gonna block the sun and earth. And the reason for that, of course, is that the earth uh, is heated by the sun 
and we radiate out into space between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. And so that turns out that that temperature corresponds to infrared light. So the sun, uh, the earth is a really bright source of infrared light. And so, uh, and then the sun actually also gives off a lot of infrared light too. So we got to block all of that out if we want to see really faint infrared things, you know, at a very big distance. So that's the point of having the sun shield. Um, this is sort of a small thing that, but, but I, I, fi I found it really interesting. It has these things called reaction wheels um, on, the, on the ship. And so basically what they do is when you want to rotate the, the, the ship clockwise or counterclockwise, you rotate these little angular momentum wheels, these reaction wheels, uh, you rotate them the opposite way, right? And that, so this, this is, um, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to do this. One of the reasons is that there's going to be actual radiation pressure on the sun. So something you don't really think about, but when you're out on the sun, out in the sun on, on a sunny day, you can feel the warmth of the sun. Um, it's actually exerting a really small pressure on you. It's, it's actually transferring momentum from the light to you, right? It's a really tiny amount, so you can't feel it. But if you have a tennis, a tennis, um, a court-sized shade, uh, the the sunlight will actually create a pressure that will push on it. And so they can make small adjustments with these angular momentum wheels, these reaction wheels, to adjust for it to keep it stable. Um, so that's why this motorcycle is here. If anybody knows anything about motorcycle riding, uh, when you jump up. Uh, you want to keep your nose kind of up in the air. So you want your motorcycle to kind of rotate clockwise. So what you do is you, you turn on the throttle and you get your back wheel rotating counterclockwise. And so, so the, the, the result of your rotating counterclockwise back wheel makes your entire motorcycle rotate the opposite way. Um, this is just a, 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 a result of angular momentum being conserved, which is just basic physics. Um, I discovered this uh, when I was about 14, a friend of mine who had a lot of motorcycles let me take, get on his little 80cc motorcycle. And as I uh, started to increase the angular momentum of the back wheel at way too fast a rate, uh, the motorcycle rotated, <laughs> rotated clockwise until the, the motorcycle was upright. And uh, I chased it for about 20 yards down a hill. <laughs> Uh, so this is going to be launched on the Ariane 5 rocket. Um, it has to be folded up and put into the nose of it. Uh, and this, is, this uh, uh, as we speak, is, is going to happen in the next month. It's, it's probably already on site and, and getting ready to go. Um, oh, there's also little tiny actuators on each of the little uh, mirrors, these, these little um, octagonal mirrors. Um, and so they, they can adjust, these little motors are going to adjust the mirror so you can get a perfect focus. And that'll help uh, mitigate any problems like we had with Hubble. Hubble was a single mirror. And so um, these are individual mirrors that you can move around to get the focus right. Uh, just, uh, and I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker. Um, some, of the ob some of the instruments that it'll have, it'll have a near-infrared camera. It'll have a near infrared spectrograph, which I'll talk some about because that's a big deal having a spectrograph. Um, it'll have another um, mid infrared instrument. Um, this is going to help with pretty pictures. Uh, it's going to have a guidance system, um, and uh, the the infrared sensors on James Webb are going to be so so sensitive that they it could in principle sense a bumblebee at the distance of the moon. Right. So these are really going to be super sensitive instruments. That's one of the things that makes it better than um, Hubble for looking for th uh, things that are far away. And we'll find out why, why infrared. I'm sort of building the uh, suspense. Like, why do we need infrared? We'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, we'll also have a, a, a coronagraph uh, on, uh, on, the, on the telescope, which is going to involve putting a disk over a star so that we hope we can see exoplanets and debris disks around other stars. And we may be able to image other planets directly, uh, at least more of them. We have done some up to this point, but uh, this will be even even better. So this uh, so what is a spectrograph good for? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, so if you have a light source like a star or a galaxy, uh, if it's passing through a cool cloud, you get uh, well. Let's let's start over here. If, if you look directly at the light, you see a rainbow, right? Think of like a prism. You've seen light go through a prism or through some some you know carved glass. 
and you get a nice rainbow image. Um, if that same light goes through a cool cloud of gas, some of the there will be some of these black lines, which we call absorption lines, on our spectrum. And these black lines, it turns out, tell us what the gas cloud is made of, right? They're like fingerprints of the gas cloud. So if the gas cloud is made of hydrogen, we'll see lines that tell us that, oh, this is hydrogen. If it's made of helium, we'll see black lines that tell us it's helium and so on. Uh, and then we can also look at emission, the emission of the cloud. Um, if the cloud is glowing and you point your spectrograph right at the cloud instead of through the cloud and at the light, you can see um, emission lines. And all these lines would correspond to where these dark lines are. Uh, so it also tells you what, what the cloud is made of. So we could tell uh, if it's made of hydrogen, if there's oxygen or you know, there's methane in the gas, we could find out what it's made of. Um, so we want to see infrared light, um, right? And so again, why, why in space? Um, we want, well, we put it in space because we want to see infrared light. And as it turns out, down here on the ground, we can see visible light great, which is lucky for us because that's what our eyes have adapted to see. Um, and we can see radio waves, okay, from deep space, but most everything else is kind of blocked out by our atmosphere. Um, things that are coming from far away, like gamma rays, x-rays, they're blocked out. Um, ultraviolet is partly blocked out, right? This is the light that gives you a sunburn if you're not careful, but you can see some of the ultraviolet makes its way to the surface. So the way to read this diagram, by the way, is think of the bottom as us on the surface of Earth, and the arrows are light coming in from space, and the red line is our atmosphere uh, blocking out certain kinds of light. You can see infrared is mostly blocked out uh, entirely, right? Um, so if we want to be able to see infrared light coming from the distant object, we need to get out into space and above our atmosphere to see it. Um, by the way, this, this works in the inverse as well, right? If you, um, you know, the sun heats up the surface of Earth and then it radiates, you know, the visible light heats up the Earth's surface, but it radiates away in infrared. Uh, and so that's what keeps our atmosphere nice and warm, right? It's like a blanket for us. And that's why we can live here because the atmosphere is holding in some of that infrared light and keeping things warm enough for us to, uh, well, to survive here. Um, of course, that's also why you don't want to put too much other stuff into our atmosphere that blocks it too much because it'll hold in, it can hold in too much energy um, as well. Okay, so whoop, lost my control. So, so a few more comparisons. Um, the James Webb is also going to see uh, further away. Um, and so I'm going to say a little bit about um, what, what it means to see further away, right? It's not just that you're looking further away with the James Webb you're actually looking further oh, back in time. And that seems like a funny concept. I'll say a little more about that in a minute, but let me leave that hanging in the air for, for the moment. But it's gonna see quite a lot further back uh, into time and further away than where the Hubble can see. The Hubble can see very far back, nearly to the what we believe are the first galaxies. But the James Webb is gonna see back nearly to what we call the dark age, uh, the dark ages before stars and galaxies existed. Um, here I show the Big Bang. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hotbed of research going on right now to find out, was it a hot Big Bang? Was it a cool Big Bang? Was there a singularity? What's the Big Bang? You know, was there really a beginning of the universe or is it oscillating? There's a lot of that going on right now, but we do know back to uh, roughly where the cosmic background radiation is and a little bit earlier. We have a pretty good picture of that. Um, so I won't say any more about the Big Bang, but we're going to see all the way back to this region with our James, with the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the area where I think we're going to see things that we didn't expect to see. Um, we're going to, I can't even imagine what they're going to be, to be honest. Um, probably things that are completely unexpected that I can't even think about predicting until we see it. Um, so the first stars are what I'm interested in, getting back to seeing what is the light from the first stars look like. Um, the first stars were made of primarily hydrogen and helium, right? Today, the sun, we know, has calcium and iron and all kinds of other things in it. We call, astronomers call them metals. If there's any chemists in the audience, I apologize for that. Anything heavier than uh, helium, we call it a metal. Um, uh, we, don't, we haven't seen any first stars definitively um, yet. Um, there are some low mass ones that we think are close in the nearby galaxy, but 
um, nothing definitive. Uh, we think that the first stars are probably super massive, maybe a thousand times more massive than the sun. Um, and, um, and so in order to find these, we have to look very far away due to what's called look back time. So I'll explain that a little bit here in a minute. Um, they probably formed around 200 million years after what we call the Big Bang. Um, so, uh, you know, so you have to look extremely far away to, to be able to see the light of these. Um, and these stars would have only lasted a few million years. In comparison, the sun's going to be around for, four, uh, for about 15 billion or so. Um, and we're at about 5 billion now. And so um, these stars were like the blink of an eye. They were huge. They burned out their hydrogen really quick. They blew up. And lucky for us, because that's what started polluting the universe with things that we're made of, right? Like iron and calcium and things like that. So what is look back time? Uh, look back time is, um, sorry, sorry for the delay. I'm just looking for a setting that I'm not going to find. I'll leave it alone. Okay. Oh, there it is. I saw it. I want to hide my floating channel. There we go. Now I can read everything. So what is look back time? Look back time is, um, it, it is an effect that we have when we look further and further away, things are older and older. Why are they older and older? Well, if you look at your a lamp in your room, right? It's, you're, you're seeing your lamp as it was about a few, maybe nanoseconds ago, right? It, it, so, so you're not really seeing it as it is right now because it takes that long for the light to get to your eye. And so if you take this to an extreme, beautiful moon out tonight, uh, the crescent moon, it might've set by now. So go out tomorrow night if you haven't seen it and Venus is up too. Uh, if you see the moon, you're really seeing it what it looked like about a second uh, or so ago, 1.3 seconds, right? So, and then if you look at the sun, you're really seeing the sun as it looked eight minutes ago. And so take this to the extreme, go look at Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to us. Um, but you'll be looking at it as it looked four years ago. And you can carry this on and on, right? Andromeda Galaxy, one of the only things, if you have really good eyes in a dark night sky, you can see the Andromeda Galaxy with your eyes. Uh, you're seeing light that left 2 million years ago, or over 2 million years ago. And so this look back, so things you're seeing as you look out into the universe are actually what they looked like a long time ago. And so the further away you look, the older these things are. And so in, in a way that's good for us because we can look back into the history of the universe and find out what did the universe used to look like 10 billion years ago or 13 billion years ago um, or before stars formed. That's where we're gonna get to. Uh, that's where we're gonna get to with the uh, James Webb. Hubble has seen some really um, distant galaxies, but we're gonna get much, dis we're gonna get back into this range out here past the 13.5. Um, We'll get out to that range with the, hub, with, the, with the James Webb Space Telescope. And so like, there we go. And so um, how should we look for the first stars and things that are far away? Why are we using infrared? Well, infrared has a lot of advantages. Um, in the nearby universe, one of the advantages of infrared is that when you look at a cloud like the Pillars of Creation where we think stars are being born, uh, infrared light can look right through those clouds, visible light like uh, in, the, in the top image here, you can't, you can't see anything inside the cloud because the, the, the visible light gets blocked. But the infrared light uh, passes right through, no problem, right? So all the light that we have in, in, uh, available to us to look through, um, you can, uh, you, you, you know, they have different properties. And so um, infrared light is interesting, right? For example, uh, infrared light can't pass through glass, right? This is why your car gets hot in the summer. Visible light comes through the glass, heats up your dashboard and your seats, and then your seats and your dashboard start to radiate infrared light, but it gets trapped in the glass. So your car gets really, really hot in the summer, right? But, you know, so it just depends on the material. Infrared light can go through dust, uh, no problem. Invisible light can go through glass, but infrared light can't. Um, by the way, um, if you wanna believe infrared light is a real thing, even though we can't see it with our own eyes, just get out a remote control and point it at your phone's camera. And you'll see, you can't see infrared light, but your phone camera, your phone's camera has, an infra, has a sensor that's sensitive to infrared light. And you can see, uh, you can see the light from your, your, uh, from your remote control 
uh, in your phone's camera. So a simple, easy experiment you can take and do. Now to see galaxies far away, we do also have to look into the infrared light for a really good reason. And part of that reason has to do with uh, the fact that our space time is expanding. So this is something that it's gonna be hard to describe in a lot of detail, but the idea is that when Einstein developed general relativity, he realized that what's causing gravity is that massive objects are actually sort of bending space time, right? Kind of like what you see in this diagram in the um, upper left. And so the idea is if you have a star behind the sun, the light just follows the bent space time. And then to us, it's gonna look like it's in the wrong position. Right? And so this was actually the way we confirmed it in the late 20s. Everybody rushed to Hawaii and they went to a, see a, a solar eclipse and they confirmed that this actually really does happen. Um, so this is kind of what a grav let's lay back up. This is kind of what a gravitational field would look like around Earth, right? Sort of this three-dimensional mesh. And um, the closer you get to the mass, the more stretched out space gets. Um, interestingly, that, has, that actually has a uh, effect on time, not just space. Right, it actually stretches time out too. Um, and you may think, this sounds like science fiction, this can't be real. Uh, but it turns out that without taking this uh, effect into account, we couldn't have GPS satellites. Our GPS satellites have to know that where they're orbiting, space isn't as stretched as it is down here on the surface of Earth. And so that time differential makes a big difference in figuring out where you are on the planet so the GPS has to triangulate to find you on the planet. Um, if we didn't account for that little bit of extra stretch uh, on Earth compared to out in orbit, you wouldn't be able to use a GPS to find yourself within three miles. Um, but if you account for it, you could find yourself within 30 meters. Uh, so we have this sort of fabric of space-time idea that, that uh, Einstein came up with. And we believe that the universe is that, that not just moving away from each other, but the universe itself is expanding, right? And so as the universe expands, um, uh, the, then you're seeing things, you're seeing light that left uh, the early universe. And since then, the universe has expanded. So when it, when it got given off by a star in, say, visible light range, so a star gave off some normal visible light, uh, by the time it gets to us 13 billion years later, all the space that it's traveling has got stretched, has gotten expanded and stretched. So now what we see it, we see it now as a long wavelength infrared light instead. I know this seems very science fiction-y, but this, this appears to really be happening. All the distant galaxies that we see all look really red. Um, and it's because the light that they've given off has gotten stretched in space over time. Um, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's pretty remarkable. But, but this, by the way, is the reason why the James Webb has to look at things in infrared light, because things really far away at the edge of the observable universe, they gave off visible light initially, but by the time it's gotten to us, it's been stretched out by the universe's expansion. So in order to see it, we need to use infrared light. Right? And so this, um, this, sort, of red, this sort of shift of visible to, um, to red light it's similar to basically the Doppler shift. It's not the Doppler shift because it's not just that objects are moving away from us, it's that the universe is expanding and so things appear to be moving away from us. But just to give you a really quick picture of what, what this means, let me just, well, you can see from this picture, I guess, actually, right? As this object moves towards us, the, the light that it gives off gets squeezed if it's moving towards you and it gets stretched if it's moving away from you. All right, so let me skip that animation for now. It's by, it's, it's an O physics animation. If you really want to find it, you can Google that. So red shifts, um, how do we see red shifts? How do we know this is happening? Well, if you look at the spectrum, remember our, our, our uh, rainbow that we looked at um, with our spectroscope, the lines that, we, and we know where all the lines should be, they're all moved towards the right when things are further away from us. And it turns out the further away they are, the more towards the red they get shifted, right? And that's because the universe is expanding. So this is just a really simple definition of what redshift means, right? Shift towards the red. It has to do with how much the lines get shifted divided by where they should be. Don't worry too much about the math. And that's related to the speed that it's moving away from us. Um, and again, for those of you who are more science-minded, um, be warned, this is, this is a simple expression for nearby objects. 
as things get further away, you have to use relativistic effects, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with that. Uh, the extreme example of something that's redshifted is the uh, the W map results. This is the cosmic background microwave radiation. Uh, when this was all given off, it was given off um, probably at around 700 nanometers. It's like red light, but it's been it's been traveling for so long. It's now been stretched into into the microwave range, almost out to radio waves, right? So that's an extreme example of the universe is expanding and the light that's been traveling through it has gotten stretched out along with it. So here's where we wanna get. We wanna to get to Redshift 18. That's where the first stars are. Uh, Hubble has found some up here around Redshift 12. Where we wanna push that further and find the light of the first stars. Um, again, the reason I'm interested in this is I've modeled the first stars. Uh, I've given my models to a colleague at the University of North Dakota who has blown them up and, uh, and we can see how bright they get. And uh, the James Webb may be able to see some of the exploding first stars if our models are right. Uh, if we don't see exploding first stars, then we know we need to go back and figure out uh, which parameter is not uh, doing what it should in our models. So, okay, that, that's, that's why we want to, that, that's what I'm really interested in. I really want to find, I want to find the beginning of the universe, right? Who doesn't want to see that? Um, but there are a lot of other things that we're going to see. Like what else? We're going to be able to find a lot of planets. Um, the the uh, the Kepler Space Telescope, which is is uh, currently in orbit, um, is uh, has found lots of planets already. In fact, uh, it's found twenty six over twenty six hundred confirmed planets around other stars, uh, which is remarkable. So, the James Webb will be able to find even more, uh, and it'll be able to go back and look at Kepler's with more resolution and more detail. And so that'll be a really exciting in time in uh, uh, looking at planets. Uh, it's not just finding planets that we're interested in though, right? We want to know more, right? If we're lucky and one of those planets crosses in front of its star, the way in 2012 and 2004, Venus passed in front of our star, right? This is uh, the famous transit of Venus that uh, you may remember hearing about. Uh, in the last decade or two. Um, it won't happen again now until 21, something like 2124 or something like that. Uh, but this is a time-lapsed image of it passing in front of our sun. And it turns out that if we can see other planets moving in front of their sun, um, what'll, be, whoops, what'll be great about that is we'll be able to let that light that passes through their planet's uh, atmosphere, through our spectrograph, and we'll be able to tell what the atmosphere of that planet is made of. Um, why is that a big deal? Uh, well, I think that probably the first, the first signs of life that we'll find out in the universe is gonna be found this way. Um, and what that means is that if you were an alien with a James Webb Space Telescope looking back at Earth and, uh, it, and Earth passed through the sunlight and you had a spectroscope and you looked at the spectroscope the spectrum of Earth's atmosphere, you would look at it and go, that's a really weird looking spectrum. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff in it that you wouldn't expect to see that forms just naturally. Um, and the reason for that is that life has completely altered the chemistry of Earth. So I think that that's what we're gonna, that's one of the things I, I think we may find. We may find other planets uh, whose spectra are, um, that look weird, right? They, they won't look like uh, they won't look like Venus or Mars, where we don't believe there's any life. Uh, it'll look different, maybe like Earth. Um, so this is going to be a big deal. We're going to be able to to look at it with unprecedented detail, uh, and that's really exciting. Um, so we're going to be able to do that. And so, by the way, this is another way you can look for planets. Uh, if you're looking at a transit and you can't see the planet, you can see the dip in the light. We do this now, but we'll have better resolution to do it with the James Webb Space Telescope. So there goes a Jupiter-like planet. You can see the dip in the light curve, and then it moves off of it. Uh, by the way, knowing how long it takes to go across the star tells us a whole bunch of things, like how big is the star, what's the, when then what its mass is, and things like that. So it's going to be exciting. Um, this, the James Webb will also have a chronograph on it, and the chronograph is that little black, uh, just a little black spot that you put over the sunlight of the star. Uh, and if you're lucky. 
and your uh, star is edge on, you can see things like planets moving around the central star. This is pretty remarkable. The Keck Space Telescope, which is a huge telescope on Earth, uh, discovered these super Jupiters. Super Jupiters are Jupiters that have many, many um, times the radius and mass of Jupiter. But you can see there's a whole bunch of them around this star. When you block it out, you can actually see them orbiting over seven years, right? They don't move much over seven years, but you know, Jupiter takes 20 years to go around our star, so not, not so unrealistic. So we're gonna build up our knowledge of planets. And um, we, when we put them on, a, astronomers will put them on a plot like this, where you look at the relative size to Earth versus the relative mass, uh, the Earth relative to the mass of Earth. And so you can see that uh, that's basically just density, right? It's really kind of like a way to look at the density of the planet. And if they're similar to Earth, we think, well, they might be small rocky planets like Earth. Or if they're uh, really big, and but the similar or lower mass, they may be more gaseous, uh, smaller, more gaseous ones. And you can see where some of our own planets fall. There's Venus, Earth, um, Mars, and uh, Mercury are way down here. They're really tiny little things. The moon would be somewhere way down here as well. Um, so Jupiter, I suppose, would probably be uh, well, Jupiter has a really big mass compared to Earth, so it'd be off the, off the scale, <laughs> somewhere way up to the right. <laughs> so we're also going to look at, uh, James Webb is going to look at our own solar system. Um, it's going to look at Mars, uh, giant planets, Pluto. Uh, it'll be look at, look at um, comets, things out at the Kuiper Belt, the really distant things. Um, who knows, maybe we'll even find that Planet X. Um, that's, the, the jury is way out on Planet X. But there were some interesting developments about that. Um, I think Mike, Mike Brown, who I believe is at Caltech, discovered that there are sort of these little asteroid-like, um, comet-like objects in the Kuiper Belt. And they were all sort of lined up and being shepherded by something that appeared to have a bigger gravity than what we could see. So there's, there's this idea that there may be something bigger than uh, maybe four times Earth size, but so far out that it's hard to find. because it's, it's, it's not reflecting much sunlight. Uh, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, again, that's, that's something that you want to wait until you get real confirmation before you believe. It. Um, it's going to help us learn about the mineralogy of asteroids. You know, that's going to that's gonna get humans excited <laughs> to go in and mine asteroids, right? Um, and so the other thing is that scientists don't really know how do solar systems form. We have an idea. We have a general picture. But we don't really know um, how planets reach their ultimate orbits and how stable are they, right? There's some theories that in our early solar system, planets like Jupiter and Saturn, they may have migrated way in close to the star. Uh, and that would have actually saved us, right? Because it would have swooped up a lot of the debris that would have, you know, Earth already had a really uh, tumultuous early life, right? If you look at the moon and look at all the craters on the moon, you can tell early in the, in the uh, solar system, we were getting pummeled by things. Um, but, but Jupiter may have saved us some of that, uh, and it probably protects us now from things in the outer, outer solar system. Uh, so we want to find out how, how do they come into the, uh, these orbits? How do they form? And there's yet more. Uh, we're, we're nearly there. Um, the Milky Way, our Milky Way, is about 13.4 billion years old. The sun's about 5 billion. So um, that means there's probably a few stars that blew up before we were here and, and uh you know, gave, you know, sort of spit out the stuff that we're made of. Um, we're probably at least a second, maybe a third or a fourth generation star. Um, and so um, we're going to look for very distant galaxies. And, and because we're looking back in time, we can piece together how galaxies uh, form, right? And so look, this is a pretty cool uh, simulation. So I'm going to just take a minute to show you this. Uh, this is the most distant galaxy so far. Let me make this as big as possible. Uh, this was a, a Hubble. Oh, look at that. I have to replay it. This is a, a Hubble. Um, so there's the Big Dipper. You may recognize that. And we're going to just zoom in in the next 30 seconds to where the most distant galaxy is uh, so far. So you, you sort of keep zooming in. Eventually, you'll see the, uh, the Hubble, the famous Hubble Deep Field. Everything you see there now is more galaxies maybe eight, 10 billion light years or so away, nothing too much. <laughs> and then finally, there's this one little galaxy uh, 
that that is uh, something like a redshift of um, redshift of maybe I think it's twelve point six or something like that. Uh, don't quote me on that. I have to go back and remember that. Um, we also know that most galaxies have supermassive black holes at the middle, like ours does. And so we'll be able to figure out, is that part of the formation of the galaxy in the early universe? Uh, how do they form, right? Do they, do they accrete? There's just this really, really interesting, again, this is cutting edge, brand new research. So don't, don't take this as, as gospel, but there's a new idea that, that it could be that the expansion of the universe could be responsible for the growth of the black holes in the center of galaxies that it may actually affect the growth of black holes. I haven't read that, uh, all the details of that yet, but it sounds really, really interesting. And it's been published and peer reviewed, so there must be some merit to it. It's gotta be confirmed, of course, and the James Webb will help with that. Um, uh, and so also what, what's dark matter? Is, is there dark matter or is there some fundamental un, lack of understanding of gravity? That's something we were really interested in getting to. Um, and what came first, galaxies or stars? There's a lot of arguments both ways, and the, the James Webb will probably almost certainly tell us what came first, the star or the galaxy. Um, I'm just going to pause here for a minute. Okay, just wanted to make sure that chat wasn't for me. Uh, and so this is how our galaxy would appear if we were outside of it, it's an artist's conception. We're about two thirds the way out from the middle of it. Uh, again, just to give you an idea of how gigantic this is, it's at least 100,000, maybe new estimates are more like 150,000 light years across. Uh, and so what that means is that the light that left a star here would take about 150,000 years to get over to here. That's at the speed of light. Um, if that were the sun, and here's the sun. By the way, if you, if you also tracked how long have we been making radio noise, right? And from on earth, uh, it would probably only be about the size of a, imagine like a BB size circle. That's about how far our sound has gotten so far. Really hasn't gotten very far in, in, in such a short time. Um, so we're making noise, but you know, no, surely nobody has really had a chance to hear us yet, unless they're really close to us. You, you never know, but um, it just takes a long time. The space is so darn big. Uh, so galaxies, uh, um, the web is gonna, Tell us all of those things about galaxies. I'll let you. I'll let you just look at this on your own. I want to get to the simulation because the simulation is pretty neat. This is what we believe galaxy formation looks like, and the James Webb is going to help us help us figure that out. So this is a, a many billion year simulation of interactions of galaxies. Every point is a star, and it's pretty remarkable. In this simulation, what you end up with after multiple interactions uh, is things that look like spiral galaxies. Um, and, and, and indeed, we think that the Andromeda galaxy is heading our way. Uh, we think that the Andromeda galaxy will arrive at our doorstep in about five or six billion years, and we're going to merge into one big, irregular looking uh, galaxy. There'll be more. Um, there's definitely going to be more. And I want to leave you again with this picture of where we are, right? That's us. And in the picture, the broader, bigger picture here, um, this is what we want to try to understand more about. Like what, what's out there at the edge of the observable universe and what we think is the, the beginning of, what, what we think is the beginning of time in our galaxy, although that, the jury's still out on that. Um, expect the unexpected. That's, that's the takeaway I want to really leave you with. Um, and get excited. Um, this is going to be really, I can't tell you how revolutionary this is going to be. Um, it's going to take off in December of this, this year. Fingers crossed, and I want to thank you again for li listening. Thanks very much to uh, Anthony who invited me to give this talk, and Laura Gert who, who uh, undoubtedly was working behind the scenes there <laughs> uh, at Penn State Brandywine. Um, and so uh, you can go and learn a lot more about all of this. Get more details at the James Webb Space Telescope site given right there. I encourage you to do that. Uh, there's so much more to discover. Um, and check us out here at Penn State Brandywine if you like. And if you're really bored one day, you can come and look at my own personal site. Uh, you can get to my research and uh, you can send me an email and ask me questions if you want about anything to do with astronomy. I'm, I'm happy to, to oblige. And I believe that's it. So I'm going to hand it back over to our, uh, our generous hosts. Let me, I think I stopped the share now. Well, Dr. Lawler, 
my mind is blown. Your energy and enthusiasm for all of this has got me excited about James Webb. And, and it's interesting, we originally had you scheduled for the state because there was a launch date of the end of October this year. That's right. So <laughs> when we booked you, it was, it was because of that time and then it got bumped. But now you have us set up and ready to go so we can pay attention for December. Yeah, there's a uh, website. There's a website with a countdown clock that you that you ought to keep somewhere handy. It's it's yeah. going to be a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> so we're almost at the hour, but we do have questions that came in on the registration form and in the chat. So I'm or, so I'm hoping maybe we can get through some of these pretty quickly. All right. Um, I know. I'll do my one, best. One of them um, that came in is. Um, oops, I wanted to see. Uh, if we can stop the screen sharing maybe too so then people can see oh, did i i thought i stopped my bad oh we're still there um someone had asked will deployment require manual labor by astronauts or will it self-deploy you've addressed that in your talk that uh, it's going up and got it yeah got to do it all by itself it's got to unfold they've tested it a hundred times yeah do you have any estimate how many people have worked on this telescope how many people oh. been involved in the design just a rough estimate yeah i mean it's gosh it's been over 20 years um people who started working on it probably are no longer working on it it's got to be many many hundreds i, I would have to venture thousands. i would guess thousands my, my, that would be my estimate 1000 plus or minus many hundreds and this is not just a nasa project because you said it's launching in south america so what's yeah. the connection with south america and NASA? yeah uh, well so we are um this is actually a partnership part part well i mean i think it's a part it's probably always been a partnership but we were lucky it was a partnership because in 2011 we nearly lost the funding for it um they were going to cancel the funding but uh esa uh the european um, space agency is a big partner and also the canadian uh space agency as well so it's it, it's not it is not just us there is also there's actually people down there at, uh in baltimore who are part of the esa who are collaborating with the, the American scientists there. Um, yeah. And then someone has also asked about the cost. What, oh, what, the cost, what would be I the know. price tag on something like that? Yeah, right. I mean, it's way over budget, <laughs> like way over budget. Um, yeah, you know, that's funny. You know, if you look at it though, as, as, a, as a fraction of an overall budget and it's over 20 plus years, you know, not, not, NASA's budget isn't really as big as people think it is. You know, it, it's actually quite small, but it, it did add up and it is over budget. Um, I can tell you, though, that um, just the space, like sort of space initiatives have led to a lot more than just exploration and, and things that scientists like me love. Like there's a lot of things that have come out of it that um, are not space related, you know, like like the James Webb, for example, I believe. Uh, the technology that we use for LASIK came from some part of the engineering that that, uh, crop, that was an outcropping of the James Webb engineering. Uh, things like Velcro, right? Velcro came out of the space space uh, uh, st study. So, so um, yeah, it is. It is. I don't know the exact number, but it's it's many billions and probably ten times at least bigger than what we we anticipated. But I mean, the, the payback is going to be. A hundredfold or more. I mean, we're, we're going to hold you to that then. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have another talk in a year or two. And we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see if, if it holds water. We would love to hear water. updates on, on what comes out of this. Um, we've got a couple questions in the Q&A here. One is, how long will it take the telescope to get into position after the launch? Why, yeah. or, why orbit the sun? And if we can't service it anyway, why not just send it further out? Yeah. Um, well, so so the the reason we're not sending it further out is that it's it's at a Lagrange point, and so yeah, there's a low energy budget there, right? So it can sort of stay there without with a minimal amount of energy. Um, the uh, so, so what, what, sorry, what was the rest of the? Uh, why orbit the sun, and if we can't, and how yeah, long will so, it take to get into that position to begin? Yeah, it, uh, yeah, this may have to be an interactive. Uh, Somebody may have to Google that for me quick. It's going to be weeks to months. I believe it's months uh, to get there. Um, it's going to unfold, and that's going to take. It's going to take another like many weeks to unfold, and then they're going to have to start testing. Um, why, why? Why orbit the sun? They wanted to get it out to that point and further away, specifically so they can block out the Earth and the sun with a sun shield, and that's because we want to use infrared light. And the Earth and the sun are just really, really bright in infrared light, and so. If you were too much closer, 
um, you would, uh, you know, you'd only hear, you'd only see the sun in the, in the uh, earth. Um, yeah, so, so the other thing too is, is if, if you get it too far away, the, the delay in communication gets bigger, I guess, right? So my guess is probably there's some benefit too to having as close as you can, but being able to block out the infrared light from, from ourselves. And the moon too, right? The moon also gives, gives off quite a bit of infrared light. And then the last question we have in Q&A here is, have we ever looked at Earth's spectra? I believe we have, um, but uh, I, I don't have immediate knowledge of that, but I'm sure that we have, right? Because we know, yeah, yeah, I, I think I've actually even seen uh, in like astronomy labs, Earth spectra and Venus spectra and stuff like that. So I'm sure that we have. And it does look, it does look strange compared to Mars and Venus. Like Mars and Venus are dominated by carbon dioxide. Um, and so because life formed here, you have all this oxygen and, and you know, other complex things in the atmosphere that you don't see on other lifeless planets. But I encourage you to go and Google that. That's a good question. I want to make this as interactive as possible. So uh, <laughs> go find out more. I tell my students that a lot. <laughs> and then I ask them to come back and tell me when they find out. <laughs> well, we certainly have your contact information and, uh, and we will add to our DCIS lecture series website some of the links that you presented. Uh, we'll Great. certainly get some more information up there about James Webb. And, uh, and yes, I, certainly, I, I hope we can get some updates in the future. And, and we've got some, some of those exciting findings that you've been talking about. And yeah. since, since we can't get that contact lens on, on this particular telescope, no. hopefully, hopefully no. we have all the calculations right and we're ready to go. Yeah, in the meantime, everybody just send good vibes and keep your fingers tightly crossed because it's, quite, it's gonna be quite a feat. <laughs> got a long way to go, but I feel confident. I feel good about it. I think it's gonna happen. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Thanks, Waller. Thank you, I, thanks for having me. Yeah. I will turn thanks it back so over to Jeremiah for closing comments. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. You know, after you've had this recent time change, um, there were some really wonderful questions. I wanted to thank Dr. Tim Lauer again from uh, Penn State Brandywine for coming and sharing this evening. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>